Mayor's appointment uh, committee is uh, called to order. Uh, one of the things I want to do, I'm a little bit out of the ordinary today. Um, I want the director came up, and so I would like for her to have an introduction, opening presentation. And um, we really appreciate you, Director Wong, for the work that you do in city planning. And um, and we we'll are open it up to your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Council Chair. Um, thank you to Council Member Starr, Council Member Harsh. I'm really excited today because we um, are here to fill two more spots for the Planning Commission. And this is, this is really key as uh, we need to have a full commission to make sure we have quorum and to move forward the business of the city um, and also the vision of the city. So I, I'm particularly excited because these two candidates are, I would call, powerhouse women. Um, you know, when they come up, they, they're able to share their own stories, but I would, I would say that they're, you know, strategic, wise, intentional, civically engaged, globally minded, um, and, and those are the types of people that we're looking for, for a planning commission to really think about Cleveland as a whole, our neighborhoods, and how we could advance the goals of council and advance the goals of the administration. So we, we searched long and hard, um, took many months, um, and uh, Mayor Bibb is very pleased to present these appointees to you today, or potential appointees. Thank Excellent. You. Uh, the committee would like to uh, call to the table Marika Clark. Do you want me to step aside? Or yes, you can. Yeah, you can. You can step aside. Or you can, yeah, you can. Well, no, you can step aside. That's Let her come on up yep. so she won't feel a certain way. <laughs> come on. Is it okay if I remove Yeah, you, you're fine. I want to thank you for taking your time today to, to be with us this afternoon and just let you know, don't uh, be intimidated sometimes. Uh, sitting here at these hearings um, uh, causes folks to be intimidated. We want you to be very comfortable and, um, and we want you to feel at peace. First, I, I, I had an opportunity to take a look at your resume. Can you give us a little bit of, of your background? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, for giving me the opportunity. And um, just to kind of, I guess, walk through a bit about my background, I think I have a little bit of an unconventional uh, design background. Um, I, I am not originally from the Cleveland area. I grew up in Northern California, um, but I grew up in a, a very uh, working class family. My father was a union machinist his entire career. My mother was um, a Japanese immigrant. She immigrated to the United States in her late 20s. I uh, grew up in Japan, so I'm a dual citizen. Um, so definitely grew up with a very kind of multicultural household. Um, she was a community college teacher her whole career. Um, and you know, but my dad was always a real kind of um, tinkerer. He studied engineering, didn't graduate from college, but um, that was kind of always his passion was making things. And so that was something that he kind of instilled in me. And so I got very interested in um, kind of how we make things and how we change the environments around us from a very young age. Um, I. I did, my, I did a, an architecture class when I was in eighth grade and um, just got really interested in design even from that young age. Um, ended up um, going across the country to study urban design and urban studies at Brown during my undergrad. Um, I did a uh, year abroad. It was a full year through Columbia Architecture and Planning School, um, a semester in New York, and then a semester in Paris. Um, really learning about kind of um, urban fabric um, in the European context, um, and then decided to apply to architecture school right out of college. But always was really, I think, equally interested in um, sort of urban design, urban fabric, um, but kind of wanted to get that grounding in the actual building design. So um, I did a master's of architecture at Harvard Design School, and then, um, while I was in architecture school, I think this is where I kind of veer off in a slightly um, unconventional direction. I um, co-founded a 
uh, design nonprofit called Mass Design Group while I was um, in grad school. Took a year off in the middle of my architecture degree um, and lived in Rwanda working on um, the design of a district hospital with a nonprofit called Partners in Health. So um, I spent quite a bit of time going back and forth to Rwanda. Dr. Paul Farmer recently passed, which was a tragedy. Um, there, there's a um, famous book um, about him called Mountains Beyond Mountains. Um, but I was you know, very lucky to be able to spend a lot of time in that context. And um, it's been very interesting actually during the COVID pandemic because um, that district hospital was really designed to try to combat um, the spread of tuberculosis, which is also an airborne infection. And so we were really thinking about some of the same things with COVID of eliminating interior hallways, trying to get as much fresh air into the building as possible, trying to think about different ways to design wards and um, how to um, give patients who are recovering access to fresh air, access to views, to nature, to beauty. Um, and that was a very formative experience for me. Um, when I came back from Rwanda and the hospital had finished and opened and was seeing patients, I really started to get interested also in um, things that design could do beyond architecture itself. And so um, I learned about a large design strategy firm called IDEO, which is a global firm. They have offices around um, Europe and Asia as well as throughout the United States. Um, and I ended up doing a fellowship um, at the nonprofit arm of IDEO, which was just launching, called IDEO.org. So I did that um, out in San Francisco, and that was really another kind of learning curve for me of learning about the process of design thinking, human-centered design, how design can be used to answer many questions beyond only um, building envelopes. Um, and so from there, I worked on a number of different types of projects around early childhood education, around sanitation, um, across many um, fields. And um, sorry, very long-winded way of saying I ended up moving to Cleveland um, because, <laughs> to be very honest, I had started um, dating my now husband um, and was, uh, you know, gently convinced to try out Cleveland. I did not have any connection to Cleveland. And that was back in 2012, um, so 10 years ago. And have really fallen in love with the community in Cleveland, um, the friendliness and warmth of people here, and the ability to really um, be entrepreneurial and creative and um, have found it to be a place where people are very supportive of. If you have an idea, they'll help you make it happen. And so um, while in Cleveland, I have kind of combined these different backgrounds. So I'm doing design consulting still with IDEO.org and a number of other different, um, very international focused nonprofits and foundations and also working on um, development and placemaking projects um, with my uh, partner. So kind of piecing together a lot of different things, um, which is what I like doing best. I that was very long. It, it was, but that's, a, it, that's okay. It gave us a little bit about your background um, and kind of brought us all the way up to why you're here in the city of Cleveland. Um, since the planning uh, commission is um, charged with making Cleveland and its neighborhoods communities of choice, um, how would you describe a community of choice? Um, I think a place that provides for the diversity of people that would live in a neighborhood, a place that um, allows people to kind of pursue their best selves and gives them opportunities, um, that allows people to thrive, raise families, um, pursue careers that they are passionate about, and um, is a place that people would would choose to live and that um, is a place that kind of we could be proud of on a nationwide or an international scale, I guess. And, and how would you uh, contribute to uh, developing these communities of choice uh, in your role on the Planning Commission? I think I can bring um, maybe a, a 
a very a sort of international perspective to thinking about um, planning goals in Cleveland and in the region. Um, I've been lucky enough to be able to spend time in many different cities at different scales around the world and um, in you know kind of the developed world and also in um, the global south and you know I think that there's things we can learn from many different types of cities and places and I think that that's something that that I can bring and, and I also think I bring kind of a maybe sort of like a strategic lens through some of my work um, with with sort of design strategy firms and thinking about, um, you know, are there parallels to how a city can grow that we could learn from other industries even? So I feel like I have a very broad view of kind of design and planning as a whole and um, could kind of bring that to bear on um, communities in Cleveland. How would you engage members of Cleveland City Council in developing neighborhood plans, uh, including zoning and design, um, and review challenges that may come up? Um, I mean, I think that I, I'm humble enough to know that I don't know any, everything by far, and so I think I would want to start by listening and really understanding um, what some of the challenges are in different areas. Obviously, Cleveland is a very diverse city. There are, um, you know, 17 different wards. There are different challenges in each ward and um, different strengths in each ward and um, really wanting to understand better, like, how can we leverage the assets in each area and strengthen those and how can we um, sort of collaborate across areas to... Um, to make changes that make sense for each area. So I guess that that's sort of a general way of saying, I think um, I would want to start by making sure I understand all of the challenges um, and not, I, I definitely would not be a person that would want to come in gangbusters and have a really specific agenda that I would want to push everywhere. I would be really interested in um, being hyper specific about about different neighborhoods, because I think that that's a more respectful way to um, be a member of this commission. So more or less in, in, in understanding um, um, the communities a little bit more, listening um, uh, and, um, and working with the members of Cleveland City Council. Exactly. Okay. Um, given, some, given that some areas uh, in the city of Cleveland haven't seen any development in 20 years, what changes would you suggest to promote development in these areas? Um, I, <laughs> I mean, I don't pretend to know the answer to this. I think this is, I think this is the question, you know, of our generation and and of the city. And I think that um, that's sort of the big meta question that we will be wrestling with for the next generation. I think there. Are probably are policies around housing, around access to um, equitable transportation, around, um, you know, projects to reduce infant mortality, all of these things that go far beyond, you know, what the Planning Commission's purview is, but that are um, the areas where all of the departments at, you know, the city of Cleveland need to be working together to kind of um, create that virtuous cycle, I guess. Um, so, you know, I mean, I'm personally very passionate about um, access to public transportation, access to child-friendly spaces, access to, um, you know, some of these basic uh, amenities and needs that can encourage other you know groups to come in and be interested in this neighborhood um, I think it's admirable some of the work that's been done around um, you know demolishing vacant blighted properties where that's necessary to make it feel um, easier to come in and do new developments um, I think more of that could be done um, and and I don't know I think the other thing is um, I, I need to keep learning and and like and seeing what other cities are doing to be able to kind of know what the right um, sort of policies are. 
That's um, fair. What uniquely qualifies you to sit on the Planning Commission and tell us why we should appoint you? Um, I think, as I mentioned, I think I bring a, I think I bring kind of a, a unique voice or sort of um, background and a, you know, a fair amount of um, expertise in terms of architecture, urban design, urban planning, um, thinking about design strategy from a very global perspective. Um, I think having a grounding, growing up in a working class environment and um, knowing what it's like growing up in an immigrant family, um, I think that I have sort of the background and the skill sets to be able to uh, be of service and make a contribution to the Planning Commission and to the city. Well, listen, I, after uh, answering these four questions, I think you did a fantastic job. Um, Want to turn it over to the committee? Uh, Chris Harsh, and then Richard Starr, Mr. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through the chair, is it, is it Ms. Shiori Clark? Uh, Shio Edie Clark. Shio Clark. <laughs> Clark is fine, though. Okay. Well, Ms. Shio Edie Clark, um, it's a very impressive resume. I think it's important for us to, to remember that Cleveland has to exist in a global context. I find a lot of people from Northeast Ohio never leave Northeast Ohio, and if they do, they never come back. So having people with some kind of experience uh, other parts of the, of the world is very helpful for us to have here. Um, before I ask you my actual question, I, I was completely blindsided. I had no idea that Dr. P uh, Farmer passed earlier this year. It sounds weird seven months later, but I read Mountains Beyond Mountains. It's a very influential book, and the, he opens that book by saying, imagine there's a, a deadly disease that kills millions of people that we can prevent. Yeah. Um, and that's what tuberculosis is. And I think yeah. about that in a lot of different contexts. There's a yes. lot of problems that we can prevent that yes. we just don't get up the initiative to do. So um, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about his passing, but in a way, thanks for letting me know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was, um, it was a huge tragedy and a loss to the field of public health, but um, I think also, ironically, I think a lot more people learned about his work and his legacy after his passing, so hopefully his work, and I know his work passes on through all the people that he worked with. So. Yeah, it was, it was uh, an incredible person. Uh, my actual only really big question is, what do you do on Fridays? On Fridays? Um, well, I have a 20-month-old daughter, so mm -hmm. I mostly do bedtime activities, and then... No, I mean Friday mornings. Oh, Friday. During when public... Oh, Friday mornings. <laughs> yes. What do you do on Friday mornings? I don't care about Friday night. <laughs> um, on Friday mornings. I, I'm privileged to have a fairly flexible schedule, so I'm able to kind of focus my work when I need to, so um, my Friday mornings are as of now open. Okay. Um, because uh, I assume that you're, 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 you're still working, I think, at, at Hingetown? Is that correct? Yeah, yep, yeah, working okay. on projects there. And so they're, they're, because planning commission meets on Friday mornings, I, yes. if I recall. So they're okay with you having most of the morning to do this, because those meetings can last five, six, seven hours. They can go for a while. Um, I have spoken to Director Huang about this, about the schedule, and I feel comfortable with it. Thank you, through the chair. Oh, okay. I, <laughs> I ask, because I can't sit through all of them sometimes. Um, okay, and um, that was my only that was my only question. I just I want to make sure that, that you've got the availability for it because it's it's a really important work. Um, it takes a lot of nuance and time, and uh, we get into the weeds uh, down at City Hall, and that's our job is to get into the weeds and, and pick up every rock and look under everything yeah. and, and figure out every aspect. And so that's it's good to know that you have the time for that. And I, I don't know that I mentioned, I also currently sit on the Ohio City Historic Design Review, so I am somewhat familiar with the structure of at least the design review portion of Planning Commission's work. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Chairman, recognize uh, Richard Starr. Thank you, Chair and uh, Committee, for um, this appointment hearing, obviously. We have some candidates here that are looking to join the City Planning Commission, correct? All right. And chair to the table, Ms. Clark Wright? Yes. I want to make sure I say it correctly. Um, I have just a few questions. And um, what are your short-term 
What are your long-term and short-term goals? Chair to Ms. Clark. Short-term and long-term goals. Um, well, I think, I don't know, I mean, to be honest, I don't know that I have really specific long-term goals. I think um, my short-term and long-term goals um, are to be working on projects that are meaningful to me, to be um, working towards um, doing what I can, doing my part in, um, you know, building up and um, improving or I guess increasing sort of the vibrancy um, of the city of Cleveland. I, you know, I mentioned I split my time between working on projects in Cleveland um, as well as doing um, design consulting projects that have a more international focus. So um, I see that continuing and, um, you know, working on making sure that I raise a healthy and happy um, young daughter as well. So I know that's not that, that um, that's not that specific, but um, I think I, I like to take on projects that feel important and meaningful to me and impactful, um, and I'm okay with not exactly knowing what that looks like in 10 years. Thank you. Um, Chair Ms. Clark, um, tell me your thoughts about Cleveland overall as a city. Um, I think Cleveland is a great city, and I think Cleveland is a city where there are so many people here who are so passionate about making the city even better, and that is one of the most important things for any city. Um, I mentioned it's not where I grew up, but I do feel like it's a city that has really become my home, and um, I think that it it has changed a lot even since I, since I moved here. Um, I lived here for 10 years. For the first few years that I lived here, I still had my California license plate, and I, or not license plate, driver's license. And I remember um, when I would be at Hopkins showing them my ID, and people would be like, oh my God, why do you live in Cleveland? Like, <laughs> go back to California. But I don't get that anymore. I really don't. I think that um, even at a national scale, now I tell people I live in Cleveland and they're really interested. They're intrigued. They're like, oh, I've heard Cleveland's really cool. I've heard, oh, I should come visit. I've heard there's like lots of interesting stuff happening there. I think that I feel personally a distinct change in that over the last however many years. So. Um, I think, I think um, to me, Cleveland is an optimistic city, and, um, and it does feel like there's a lot of things happening here that, um, that I'm excited to see how they play out. All right. Um, Chair Ms. Clark, with so much development that have, have occurred in the city of Cleveland the last 10 years, can you name one project that has been um, big in the news or any project that has been dear to your heart that you follow that you can speak on a little bit about that project? From chair to Ms. Clark. Can it be a project that I worked on? <laughs> um, well, I, I'm, I am proud of the work that um, my husband and um, many partners um, have worked on um, in our little pocket in Ohio City. Um, the church and state project that we uh, finished in 2020 um, was the result of several years of very hard work and um, finding ways to make the project happen, finding ways to finish the project even in the face of a global pandemic. Um, and I'm proud of the way that we took a large site that was a gravel parking lot, made it into um, two buildings that now have, you know, that, that now is 100% leased and has 158 new families that live there. Um, I'm particularly proud of the way we were able to split up that site um, into um, two buildings with a public space that runs through the middle. So we were able to bring in some very playful elements like um, there's a large red spiral slide that has been very popular, has even gone viral on TikTok. Um, there's a, um, a teeter-totter and a splash pad that's very popular in the summer. Um, a lot of things that I think just bring a lot of play and joy 
um, to the, that part of the neighborhood and that infill what was kind of a missing tooth in the urban fabric into something that is now a very vibrant part of the neighborhood. Um, we were also able to use a lot of natural materials. Um, we brought in a really beautiful slate material, um, um, used a lot of sort of um, material contrast on the facade. I think we're able to create something that feels very unique, um, but still maybe retains a bit of the sort of sculptural masonry aspects of some of the more historic projects um, that I've also worked on in the neighborhood. Okay, thank you for that response. Um, Chair, I have a couple more questions and I yield the floor. Um, do you know about the communities in Cleveland? If so, which ones are you most familiar with? Um, can you elaborate on certain different communities um, and your thoughts on the communities that we have in Cleveland? Um, to be honest, I'm definitely the most familiar with the neighborhood where I live um, because it's, it's where I've lived um, since moving to Cleveland, which is the near west side Ohio City area. Um, I'm also definitely quite familiar with the adjacent areas of Detroit Shoreway, of Tremont, of downtown, of um, kind of old Brooklyn, um, Clark Fulton, that entire near west side area, um, which obviously has seen quite a bit of development. Um, I have spent, um, I, and I'm ex very excited to spend more time in many of the east side neighborhoods. Um, I have spent time over um, on some of the east side neighborhoods. My husband and I love going to Mount Pleasant Barbecue, and we definitely spend, um, I'm working on um, a design for a public park um, in the Asia Town neighborhood. So I've spent quite a bit of time in the Asia Town, Midtown neighborhood, have done a lot of community engagement um, with neighbors um, in that area. And for me, it's very exciting as a half Japanese um, person to kind of understand um, the vibrancy of the Asian community in Cleveland, um, which I feel like is um, not as big as the Asian community in California, but still quite thriving, thriving and vibrant. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know. I I um, I feel like there's many different hidden gems um, in many neighborhoods throughout Cleveland's east side and west side, and I'm excited to spend even more time kind of exploring in different areas. So um, I appreciate the question. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so is it fair to say that you're mainly familiar with um, communities such as Ohio City, downtown, Detroit, west side areas, and parts of downtown? Um, I don't, I, I've, I have spent time on, in other neighborhoods other than those, but um, I, those are, I mean, I've never lived in other neighborhoods in Cleveland, so those are, I would say, inherently the ones that I'm the most familiar with. Okay, question chair to Ms. Clark. Have you spent time in central neighborhood? I have spent, a, I have spent some time in central neighborhood, not, a, not as much time as I, sh like, I, I guess would hope to in the future, but... Um, have you spent time in neighborhoods such as Collinwood, um, 105, Superior, St. Clair, yes. um, yeah. North Broadway? And if you have, can you elaborate on your time spent in these type of neighborhoods? Because I have some questions and, and some concerns due to the fact that um, the City Planning Commission works throughout the whole entire city. Yes. Um, with me and Ward 5, with the most undeveloped land usage in in the city of Cleveland, one of the, one of the top three highest of undeveloped land, and as a council member, we're looking to change that. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, a lot of that, a lot of the development goes through planning commission. And I'm trying to make sure I understand who is on the part of the members who are part of the board, part of the committee, to help understand the neighborhoods. Oh. And, and I am a Clevelander. Yeah. Born and raised here my entire life, got educated here as well as work on um, grassroots level in the neighborhoods, in all different parts of the neighborhood. I worked yeah. on the west side through my activism and worked through Boys and Girls Club. I've been in uh, Mount Pleasant neighborhood, um, Collinwood neighborhood, Broadway, Glenville, for me to have familiar energies with the neighborhoods, how territorial most of
of our neighborhoods are, even though we have diversity, mm -hmm. it's understanding those neighborhoods before we can even do development. Yep. Because a project may look great on paper, but in this neighborhood it might not fit based on what the needs are in that community. So when I'm asking these questions, I'm trying to get an understanding of who you are, um, what you have done in Cleveland, you know, where I'm from, we say those receipts, um, those paperwork, that means a lot to us Clevelanders when mm -hmm. we're talking about who are getting into positions to be able to have a voice and also be able to help move and drive projects. So my final question I would definitely want to ask is, why do you want to join this um, commission and why should we um, vote to appoint you to this position? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I just want to... Um, clarify. Um, I have definitely spent significant time in the Collinwood neighborhood, in St. Clair Superior neighborhood, in Slavic Village, um, in University Circle, Larchmere, Little Italy. I am familiar with the neighborhoods of Cleveland, not only the near west side neighborhoods that you mentioned. So I want to just make sure that that is clear. Um, and I think that there are um, extremely um, vibrant and um, and tightly um, woven communities um, in all parts of the city and uh, and I and I by no means want to make it seem like I'm not interested in other neighborhoods other than kind of the near west side neighborhoods where I happen to live but um, it's important to me um, to look at kind of how development can be spread out across all parts of the city. Um, I think that I think that one of one of the 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 ways that I tend to work, especially through design consulting projects and sort of the human centered design process, um, is really a focus on listening first and and not always assuming that you know everything. And so um, I think part of what I really would want to work on is understanding where are their blind spots. As you say, I think it's a really important point that um, some projects might look good on paper but might not be right for certain neighborhoods or certain locations. Um, and, and that's something that the people who live in each community are always going to know better and in more detail and with more intimacy than um, somebody who doesn't live there um, who has gone to visit. So I think that that's something that I would really want to focus on is are there ways to um, not always assume you know the answer, but but make sure that you're sort of taking counsel from people who are experts on each community, as well as um, myself spending time throughout the city and around in each neighborhood. Yep, and Chair, my final question. Thank you, uh, Chair to Ms. Clark. Thank you for um, your responses. One last question I would have. Are you familiar with um, Opportunity Corridor, Chair to Ms. Clark? Um, yes. Sorry, through the chair. Um, yes, I'm familiar with the, uh, the Opportunity Corridor project. Okay, one question I would have about Opportunity Corridor, Chair to Ms. Clark, would be, um, what are your thoughts about the police headquarters being located on um, Opportunity Corridor where? Um. If you don't know, you can say you're not familiar, I'm, so. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think I'm familiar enough to to speak on that and have a really strong opinion on it, but I'm happy to do more research on it and, and come back with a better opinion. No problem. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Ayu. Uh, thank you, um, um, Councilman Starr. The, the Chair recognizes uh, Anthony Harrison. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll be, uh, I won't be too long. Um, is it Ms. Clark or Mrs. Clark? <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Clark. All right. I won't try to pronounce the, uh, your, your, the other part of your last name. So please forgive me, Mrs. Clark. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, just a few questions. Uh, I see under your name you have social impact designer. Can you elaborate? Uh, yes. Um, so it, it really refers to kind of the, the process of using design to um, look at social impact questions or social impact areas. I mentioned um, working on um, consulting across a number of different fields. So um, 
I have worked, for instance, I spent about a year working with the International Rescue Committee looking at um, how to um, bring um, early childhood education um, classes and activities to families living in um, the Syrian response region. So I spent quite a bit of time um, in refugee camps in uh, Lebanon and Jordan looking at that. I worked on a, um, I worked with a sanitation startup in Ghana that um, was looking at how to bring low cost sanitation services to families where there's not actually a sewer grid mm -hmm. um, through many parts of um, urban areas in Ghana. So just a couple of examples of different ways that design can kind of be brought to bear to um, look at um, solutions or, um, or ways to address uh, questions that might um, otherwise continue to be sort of burdens on different communities. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I recently interacted with another individual who uh, is a social impact designer. And their um, thoughtfulness, um, I won't say the projects because they're still working on them, you know, it was kind of unique when I, when I interacted with them. So I, I saw them do your name and so I said I thought I'd ask, you know, what, it, what it, your experiences have been yes. um, around that. Through the chair to uh, Mrs. Clark, you also mentioned in your remarks that you believe your international, um, I won't say adventures, but your international work uh, makes you a, a unique candidate uh, for this position. Can you explain to the committee and those who are watching what about your international experiences you believe you know makes you fit for this role on the Planning Commission? What, what, what do you what do you think that brings to the, uh, to the Planning Commission, if anything. Mr. Chair, to Mrs. Clark. Um, through the chair. Um, I, I think that um, it's important to, when thinking about how cities grow and develop, um, I think it's important to be able to um, have an understanding maybe of best practices that have been tried in other cities around the world and around the country um, and and being able to see where um, I think everything from transit systems to um, ways to look at child care early childhood development to um, play spaces to public art to um, approaches to public education, there are so many areas where um, we can learn from other cities and, and um, you know, that's not to say that whatever's happening in some other country is inherently better than what's happening here. That's certainly not true. But um, I think that um, it can only benefit us to have as wide as possible of a reach in terms of where we can look for um, inspiration and references and things that maybe we can borrow and look at um, how we can um, shape new ideas for projects or policies or initiatives that that could kind of improve the communities and the urban fabric in Cleveland. So um, I, don't, I don't know that I have really specific examples, but I think, for instance, there's a lot of really um, interesting ways that different cities have handled protected bike lanes, public transit systems, um, bicycle infrastructure yeah. specifically. Um, and, and I think that's the case through many different other realms of sort of urban life where, um, where it just can be helpful to see what, what people have really embraced around the world. Sure, thank you for that. Through the chair to Mrs. Clark, you just mentioned one of my, one of my points that I was thinking is that urban life can look like many different things in many different places. And so I just wanted to hear from you because you have experienced urban life in many different settings, not only in the U.S., but abroad. And so wanted to hear kind of your thoughts around what you have taken away from those experiences, what you have learned, what you have seen, and how and, and what that impact looks like if you are, if you are appointed to uh, the Planning Commission. So I appreciate uh, your answer. And, and you also mentioned you have a unique skill set. What are those, what, through the chair to Mrs. Clark, can you explain what that unique skill set is that you believe that you bring to the committee? Uh, yeah, um, 
through the chair um, to the councilman. Um, I, I was referring to um, having kind of a dual background between um, having an architecture and urban design background as well as having a more design strategy, design thinking background. Um, I think that that is somewhat unusual. Usually um, people who study architecture stay in architecture or at the, you know, the most maybe would venture into landscape architecture or urban design, whereas many of the colleagues who I work with um, at um, the sort of more design strategy organizations might tend to have either a business background or um, in industrial design or graphic design background. So it's really pulling from a very different a type of person with a different um, type of education. So I think that I'm privileged to be able to um, spend time with work colleagues that come from a wide array of backgrounds and so can kind of learn from a broader maybe sphere of design related um, influences than if I only had a background in architecture or urban design. Sure. Okay. Thank you. I, I just wanted to hear what those unique skill sets were. You know, you have a lot of information and a lot of uh, just kind of, you shared a lot of your experiences on your resume. Um, you've done a lot of, lot of, lot of things, <laughs> I'll say that. Um, and just wanted to kind of bring it all together to have a better, uh, a more um, uh, intentional understanding about, you know, your experiences. Um, lastly, Mr. Chair, um, to Mrs. Clark, you mentioned that your interaction with the Planning Commission has been solely around your involvement on the Ohio City Landmarks Committee. Is that correct, Mr. Through the Chair? Um, through the Chair, I um, we did we ha I have gone I have gone before Planning Commission before. Um, but usually the projects that I work on go through the landmarks process, so they would go before the Ohio City uh, or Tremont or Flats um, design review and then go before Landmarks Commission and uh, Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, so I, and I mentioned that I now sit on the Ohio City Historic Design Review Board as well. Historic Design Review Yeah, so I, so I was just mentioning that I have some experience with um, sort of the, the length and the way that, um, that I guess other design or other review boards um, are run. Sure, so through the chair to Mrs. Clark, so you, so you have some understanding of how uh, and what the role of the Planning Commission is and how they function. Mr. Yes. Councilman Hart has asked you about your Friday mornings, you know, whether you have the, the time to commit to uh, potential five-hour meetings. It could be a five-minute meeting, depends on what right. you have there, but I've never seen a five-minute Planning Commission meeting, by the way. But I have seen five hours, though. Um, besides your uh, work on the Ohio City's historic uh, design committee, correct me if I'm wrong. What has been your other interactions with the, uh, the city's planning commission? Um, we went before the planning commission um, to do, um, I think we had to do a, um, a spot zoning for the church and state project and presented before planning commission um, for that project. Um, I believe that's the only time that we had to actually, that, that I had to actually directly interact with Planning Commission. There may have been one other time. But sure. as I mentioned, usually it's always through the landmarks process. Sure, thank you, uh, Mrs. Clark and Mr. Chair. Uh, w did you ask to be a part of the Planning Commission or someone approached you to be a part of this commission? How did this come about? Um, I was, um, uh, well, I've, I mean, it, I was, uh, I had a conversation with Director Huang about it mm -hmm. and um, just to kind of talk through if it was something that I might be interested in. Um, and, you know, after giving it some thought, I, I thought it was something that I really felt like I um, could make a contribution and um, could kind of be of service. So that's sort of how it Got it. Happened. Thank you. And lastly, Mr. Chair, um, because of your uh, 
constant interaction with the Landmarks Commission and uh, the role that you play now by sitting on that his Ohio City Historic Review Committee. Did you consider maybe serving on the Landmark Landmarks Commission versus the Planning Commission? Or are you are okay with serving on this role? Do you, do you, do you, would you prefer to be there versus here? Um, I don't think so. I, I think that the Planning Commission, to me, has a broader purview of the areas that it can touch. Landmarks is kind of very specifically focused around the Department of Interior standards um, and looking at kind of um, appropriateness around building design itself, whereas I think the Planning Commission um, has um, a wider sort of um, array of areas that um, it can focus on in terms of thinking strategically about um, the urban fabric of Cleveland. And so sure. to me, that I'm, that's more interesting to me. But I think Landmark Commission also is hugely important, and I'm very grateful for all the time that um, those uh, members have, have spent with me. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, no further questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Clark. Uh, very thoughtful uh, responses, and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished gentlemen. Um, you know, as we um, um, look at your resume, um, it's very impressive, Ms. Clark. I think that um, as the mayor of the city of Cleveland has, uh, has made you his representative here, um, as it relates to having an opportunity to sit on the Planning Commission, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for interviewing with us, uh, in addition to um, and taking the time to want to serve. Um, uh, it is a, a huge responsibility, um, and as the city is looking forward to um, expanding and growing, we need great minds such as yourself. And uh, just want to take this opportunity to thank um, uh, the mayor for your selection. Um, I think you did a wonderful job uh, here uh, this um, this afternoon, and if the committee doesn't have any readiness, uh, we'll approve her nomination. All right, so the nomination is approved. Welcome to the city of Cleveland. Thank you so much, right. Chair. Thank you so much, Council Members. Absolutely. The Chair wants to um, bring up Mrs. Erica Anthony. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mrs. Anthony. I uh, want to just take the time to say, you know, as you go through this interview process as one of the mayor's appointments uh, to the Planning Commission, um, that don't be intimidated by the group here. Um, uh, it, you know, sometimes it can be kind of intimidating to sit here and, and go through the interview process. Uh, we appreciate the time that, that you, you know, are here, and, uh, and we look forward to um, um, uh, having you here this afternoon. Um, since the Planning Commission is, is in charge with uh, making Cleveland and its neighborhood communities of choice, uh, how would you describe a community of choice? Yeah, good afternoon to the Chair, uh, Councilman Joe Jones, and to the members of Council represented here today. I uh, just want to start by saying thank you. Uh, thank you first to the Mayor of the City for the nomination to Director Wong and her leadership uh, over the Planning Commission, or excuse me, over the Planning Department. Um, it's an honor. Speak to right on it. Oh, sorry. It's an honor to uh, be nominated and be before you all this afternoon. Um, I want to start by first acknowledging that I am not a native Clevelander, um, but have been living in Cleveland for nearly 17 years, um, and that is a choice. Um, I was born and raised in Long Island, New York, uh, came here, which, you know, another conversation I could share more about how I got here, but came here with family um, and honestly came here thinking, oh, I'm going to be here for six months to a year and help my family get settled and I'm going to make my way back home to New York. Um, and have I, as I have jokingly said over the years, Cleveland courted me, we dated, we got engaged, and now we're in this long-term relationship and I'm grateful that forces beyond myself led me to this city. When I think about a community of choice, I think about agency, I think about belonging, I think about happiness, I think about joy, I think about people feeling encouraged, 
and inspired to want to do right, not by them, just by themselves, by their neighbors, by their family, and all the institutions that make up a city. Um, there's no one institution that can make or break a city. We need our education. We need our edu educational institutions. We need our social services. We need our human services and all the different nonprofits and other stakeholders that make our city whole. Um, so for me, a city that is embracing of one, understanding the truth of what happened in that particular city. Um, my husband is an educator. History uh, and social studies is his licensure. Um, so I've learned a lot from him over the last 15 plus years. And in many ways, I can say I can, I've gained a greater appreciation for history, maybe not as much as I had in my schooling. Um, but I think history is really important. Um, I think reconciling and having truthful, sometimes uh, radically honest conversations can help move us forward. Um, people's feelings are their feelings, um, and we have to honor that, whether it's a, a previous, you know, sort of situation that may have occurred in a neighborhood or a present day issue, we have to honor the diversity of truths that make up the, the residents of our community. Um, it's not about me saying it's right or wrong, um, but it's about me listening and making sure that I have an authentic understanding of what that person's perspective or that community's perspective is about what is a neighborhood choice of for themselves? So I shared with you what, what my qualities and qualifications are, but I think it's important that we uh, create an open space to continually receive that input um, because it changes, right? It looks different for every person in our city. Well, looking at your resume is, you know, is, is quite impressive. Um, t tell me a little bit about uh, you being the co-founder uh, and director of um, Cleveland Boats. I would love to. Thank you, Councilman, to the chair, to the council members. Um, so uh, about, I guess now, since 2014, um, our co-founder and myself, Crystal Bryant, uh, Crystal in a full-time capacity uh, serves as our NACP Cleveland branch executive uh, director. Um, but back then, her and I, um, in different professional um, endeavors, were working to support individuals returning from incarceration or who have been impacted by the criminal legal system uh, through a coalition that still exists today here in the city of Cleveland, the Greater Cleveland Reentry Coalition. Her and I had the opportunity to co-chair a community that was, or committee, excuse me, that was focused focused on uh, education and community engagement. And pretty early on, her and I identified the need to prioritize voting rights as one of our committee's priorities. There are a tremendous amount of urban myths about whether or not someone who has a prior conviction um, can or cannot vote, um, and those laws look different from state to state. Thankfully, here in the state of Ohio, once an individual leaves federal or state prison, they simply just have to re-register to vote. Um, if someone is sitting in county jail awaiting sentence, they can vote by mail. Um, if someone is at a community-based correctional facility like Oriana or Salvation Army, they can also cast their ballot. Um, but a lot of lay persons do not know that. A lot of, we felt at that time, uh, this was about 2010, 2010, 2011, um, we felt that uh, at the time we were going through a major county government transition from the Board of County Commissioners to our current form, and we felt that it was important that the individuals at that time that were running for county executive and the various council seats uh, understood that Returning citizens are a priority population for our community. Um, so her and I, this was pre-Cleveland Votes, uh, held voter education forums and mayoral forums, candidate forums to make sure, again, the broader community understood that this particular population is an important population that should be considered in decision making. Unfortunately, our county holds um, not a great uh, badge, which is incarcerating the highest percentage of individuals to state prison out of all 88 counties in our state. And we also receive the highest percentage of folks returning from state prison, even if they have not um, origin originated from Cuyahoga County. So. You know, regardless of people's opinion about someone who has a prior conviction, we have thousands of individuals right here in our community that have been impacted. Um, so before Cleveland Votes was Cleveland Votes, uh, we did that work and quickly realized that there are unfortunately many other historically marginalized, disenfranchised members of our Cleveland community that we felt weren't receiving equitable access to the ballot, um, which then led to us forming Cleveland Votes 
um, from 2014 through just here, March of this year. Uh, somehow, some way, we've been able to manage the organization in addition to our full-time responsibilities. Um, we had a number of staff that have worked for Cleveland Votes, um, but I made the decision late last year that um, I felt that it was time for us to have our inaugural executive director, and I was thankful that our board and the staff welcomed me to step into that position. Impressive. Um, it says here that you were the Vice President of Government Relations and Strategy uh, in Cle Cleveland Neighborhood Progress, which is an organization that has a history of helping neighborhoods develop uh, their communities out. Can you tell us a little bit more about your experience in that arena? To the Chair, to the members of Council, most certainly. I actually have to say honestly that my tenure at CMP really allowed me, I think, to to gain a renewed appreciation for the infrastructure of cities. So my, my master's is in public administration. And at that point, I had been living in Cleveland um, maybe just about eight or nine years when I started at Neighborhood Progress. Um, and you know, I, I felt like I understood the city. Um, all of my work since I've been in, in the city here has been Cleveland-centric, um, mostly in direct service up until that point. Um, um, so I felt like I had a good sense and a pulse of what was happening in Cleveland, uh, the different institutions, as I noted before, that make up a city. Um, but my, my tenure at CMP really allowed me, I think, to see, you know, peel a couple of lay layers of the onion back um, to really better understand infrastructure, um, which I think is incredibly important to how you mitigate challenges and also create opportunities uh, for improvement in communities. My work was limited to policy, but inevitably I had great interaction with colleagues um, that had subject matter expertise, whether it was our real estate director or our architect on, on staff. Um, I quickly realized who I needed to become friends with at my job. Um, they say policy fo folks, you know, we're generalists at best. Um, and I, I'm grateful for the, the friendships and, and the colleagues that I was able to form over that time because they really took the time to help me understand um, some of the nuances as it relates to development in our city or just really the infrastructure of how things are happening in the neighborhoods. My tenure also allowed me to essentially work with every community development corporation in the city, which we have 27 of those, um, and vicariously, you know, the residents that make up those cities. Um, you know, during my tenure, I had opportunities to support colleagues, uh, such as a former colleague, um, Ms. Gilson, who did an annual convening called the Progress Institute, uh, which which was in some ways the, the community development corporations like hurrah for the year, you know, kind of bring the, the network together to learn and share information with each other. Um, each year that I was at Neighborhood Progress, I facilitated workshops um, on different topics from policy to government relations to civic engagement. Um, I also had the opportunity to support advocacy, of course, and legislation, um, bringing back earmarks from the, the state um, to support development in our region, working with our state state legislators, our, our state reps and senators, uh, to ensure that we were advocating and making sure that the issues of, of Cleveland were being prioritized when different earmarks were being made, either through the general budget or through the capital budget. Um, I can go on. There are countless examples, but I think the, the most important thing to note is that I went into that job understanding that I didn't have all the answers. I didn't know everything about the functionality of the city. You know, I, I very much see cities as organisms. They need constant nourishment. Um, you need to invest in them in multiple ways. You need to really pour into them um, and then obviously honor and recognize that we all play a different role um, and, and, you know, not to mission creep, you know, so I, I stayed in my lane, um, but I'm grateful for the colleagues that allowed me to increase my knowledge and my capacity in really understanding some of these nuanced ways of operating and functioning in a city. You also secured um, over $1 million. Talk about that. Yeah. As a... Uh as being a representative there. For sure. Um, and of course, nothing is ever done done on, on my own um, in partnership and collaboration with my colleagues at the time. Um, there were a number of different projects over my tenure at CMP that we advocated uh, to receive earmarks. Um, for those that may not know, uh, Cleveland Neighborhood Progress uh, was pivotal in redeveloping the, Saint Luke, the former St. Luke's Hospital, uh, which is now the current headquarters of a number of institutions, including uh, the St. Luke's Foundation and, and Cleveland Neighborhood 
progress in the Boys and Girls Club. That was before my tenure, uh, that, that that work and, and actual development occurred. Um, but there was still lots of opportunity around uh, the physical building as well as the building in itself. Um, so there was uh, legislation and earmarks that we were able to secure to improve the RTA station, uh, which sits on 116th and Shaker Boulevard, as an example. Um, I believe in my last year, we were able to work with our state delegation uh, to secure resources for the Brit Oval, uh, which is the green space that sits uh, just, I guess, north of the St. Luke's campus. Um, to ensure that we were maintaining that green space. Um, since then, there's been a lot of development, uh, new townhomes that have gone up. Those were in the works while I was at CMP, but the actual construction um, didn't start until after I left Neighborhood Progress. Um, but we were intentional through our engagement with residents in the neighborhood, both the residents that were currently living in some of the housing surrounding that green space, as well as others in the Buckeye Shaker area, um, to talk about, you know, what do you want to come of this space? Um, I could actually recall a, a charrette session that my colleague at the time, Mr. Mortensen, led uh, with students from Boys and Girls Club, residents from the senior living facility, and other folks. And I just remember sitting there listening to the kids, particularly, um, who had these just outlandish ideas about how to use the green space. Like, we should have a carousel, or we should have this, and we should have that. Um, and while many of the projects obviously were not feasible for that space, um, I think it's just really important to encourage that imagination, right, and really har harness the energy that, that folks bring to understand that just because I want this particular thing doesn't mean that can impact an com entire community. Um, so there was intention to maintain that green space, and I'm glad that we were able to, to secure resources to do that. Um, there was also some added um, resources on the front side of the building, which faces Shaker Square. There, there was actually a slide put in, <laughs> which is accessible to the children that are served by the Boys and Girls Club, and of course, any other um, children in the neighborhood. So. It's not easy. I will be the first to say that. Um, lots of time on 71. It's actually the time period where I really uh, began to love podcasts, if I'm being honest, because it uh, spent a lot of time in the car. But um, over, the, over the tenure and honestly to present day, the relationships that I've been able to garner with our, our state legislators, not just those that are here in Cuyahoga County, but that represent other parts of Ohio, um, is, is an incredibly important experience that I'll, I'll never take for granted. Um, that that is absolutely impressive as it relates to um, talking about your time um, with um, neighborhood progress, and and it also answers the question about community of choice. But if you want to add to that, as a, um, a planning commissioner, uh, how would you work with um, uh, developing communities of choice? Thank you for the question to the chair, to the members of council. Um, I, honestly, I think it has to start by listening. Um, you know, I've had diverse experience as far as the type of organizations, the type of populations that I've engaged in, um, but it's, it's an ongoing life journey. Um, whether it's through the direct service work I did at the Center for Families and Children, which is in Councilman Starr's ward, uh, to the work I did at Oriana House, uh, working again with the individuals returning from incarceration, or to the dozens. Uh, uh, is that in Stars Ward too? It's right on the border. I think, I believe it's Ward 7 technically. Uh, so Councilman, uh, Councilwoman, excuse me, House. Um, so, you know, I think the, the populations that I've had the great fortune of working with give me the humility to understand that I don't have all the answers, um, but I'm also very inquisitive. Um, you can ask my, my parents, I was the why child, uh, many of us were, but why are we doing it like this and why are we doing it like that? Um, but I think that that desire to understand you know, starts as a child um, and has continued to grow over the years. I'm incredibly inquisitive. I don't take anything for granted that just because it occurred this way that it needs to continue that way. Um, over my tenure at, at CMP, as an example, I had the opportunity in partnership with others to bring the Undesigned Red Line uh, exhibit to Cleveland. Uh, we initially brought that exhibit to Mount Pleasant Community Development Corporation, um, and intentionally, because we felt that 
Mount Pleasant, unfortunately, still is a, is a community that is not celebrated and or appreciated for its gifts. Um, and it's also, of course, one of the neighborhoods that was most impacted by redlining in the early 1900s. Um, the success, if you can call it that, not that the topic was successful <laughs> as far as like us wanting to talk about redlining, but there was an overwhelming response from community. Um, elders came out, you know, individuals from the neighborhood came out. And I think one of the most impactful conversations I had was with a, a mature gentleman uh, who, who shared with me that he had gratitude for us putting this on the front line in, in many ways in his community, but more importantly, to give him the, the, the lexicon, the language. He's like, I didn't know about these terms, you know, I didn't know about these policies that occurred, you know, from the 1900s, obviously, to present day, but I, I know what my family has experienced. I know what my grandparents, my you know, great-grandparents, what they experience. And now you've given me the agency, the power, the language to actually be able to talk about this in a thoughtful way. You know, we were also very intentional in bringing that to the West Side, right? Because logic would you say- You brought the same project to the West Side in terms mm -hmm. of redlining as well? Yeah, so it was the same exhibit. Um, we ended up making it a mobile exhibit. So it was, it still actually is <laughs> technically at Mount Pleasant, but we had another version made that became a mobile exhibit. Um, we intentionally brought it to the West Side because we felt like, you know, that is an area that has not, has, has not received as much disinvestment over the years, um, maybe does not uh, receive the same impact of redlining that other parts of our community, but we wanted to make sure residents in the West Side part of our, of our city also understood the impacts of redlining, and then we ultimately also brought it downtown to Trinity um, on the CSU campus. Um, you know, that was a, a really really important time in my tenure here in Cleveland, um, both just to be in service to the community, to bring this information. Um, the, the exhibit very much also aligned with work that was happening at CMP, as well as uh, my colleagues, Third Space Action Lab, who still are hosting racial equity um, and inclusion trainings. Um, and, and very much we felt like this was complementary knowledge that our community needs to have. Um, we also understand that we have different learners, right? People absorb and learn information differently. So not everyone could necessarily sit through a half day or a two day racial equity training. Um, so we really played off of each other to make sure that we were making both opportunities accessible to the community so that they could still gain the information and the knowledge. Well, you know, I had an opportunity to um, uh, go to Mount Pleasant um, and also uh, coming into council uh, working to help fund them. And one of the things that was a huge impression upon me was that exhibit. And to sit here and see you're the person who brought that exhibit there is impressive. Thank you. And that exhibit was was profound and powerful, okay. uh, and it went it extended far back, and it is is still uh, relevant today. Yes, um, it is uh, issue of redlining and certain neighborhoods that get investment, and communities that don't get investment. Yes. Since you put this whole proposition in place, at least to be a learning experience for Clevelanders who may be aware or not aware. Um, sitting on a commission talking about communities of choice, um, how, how do we begin, because we still have the same dilemma that we've had uh, over the last 200 years in our communities. Yes. Um, so how do we begin the process to spur economic <laughs> development? And it has been a topic of discussion here, especially when we talk about ARPA funds, resources, and, and how to leverage those resources to have a profound impact and change the community and spur a sense of fire of economic development, not just in certain parts of the city of Cleveland, but throughout the city of Cleveland. How do we do that if you ever give, if you've given that any thought uh, for the east side of the city of Cleveland, which unfortunately uh, has 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 bore the, the 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 brunch and the heavy weight of not being invested in. To the chair, to the members of council, um, I'll start by saying I don't have the answer, but I am committed to working in partnership with council, with the planning commission, to make sure that I'm prioritizing the values that I think would get us to your answer. So I just want to be transparent that I, I don't have the magic wand. Um, if I did, maybe I wouldn't be sitting here with you all. I'd be on someone's island, right, sipping Mai Tais. Um, but I think the values are important, right? The values start with my own family, my parents, what they embedded in me, and understanding you know, 
the respect that I provide, right? My mom and dad would often say, you give you know, the same level of respect to the janitor as you do to the CEO and everyone in between, because each person, unfortunately a gendered statement, but each person is putting their pants on the same way, right? Um, so I think it starts there, is, is we have to have respect. And part of gaining respect is reconciling with the truth of the reality. And I felt like while it was a, a snippet of time that, that the exhibit was here in the city, and in many ways, honestly, the pandemic is what interrupted it. Um, and I think it's something that should come back, just as a note. Um, but I think, you know, really it gave the grounding to say this this was our reality and this is our reality, right? As you just noted, Chairman, uh, redlining has re-manifested itself in a multitude of ways, right? What we're feeling what we're feeling right now are things like digital redlining, right? That that term wasn't even a thing 10, 20 years ago, but we know that lack of broadband access for the members of our city um, is a huge issue. Um, you you know, we saw this particularly exasperated, of course, during the pandemic in ensuring that children who had to be home, obviously remote, uh, for their safety uh, had access to gain their, their lectures and their curriculum and, and the materials they needed. But I think specifically as it pertains to development and, and really trying to understand what makes development, it's not just place, right, but it's people in place, right? And I think it's important that the people have a voice, right? And that understanding that there are certain structures and hierarchy and, and forms of leadership that are put in place for a reason, but equally as important is the voice of residents, right? So when we think about the major investment of the American Rescue Act dollars that are coming not just to our city, but to cities across this nation, these are lifetime, generation-only investments. So it, we have to take it with a, a critical eye to not just think about the now, right? Because you know, innately as humans, we wanna we wanna be quick. We wanna like address what's happening right in front of us. But we have to be thoughtful. We have to be strategic. We have to think about not just how this particular investment, ARPA as an example, can make an impact for our city. But then, how do we flip that? Right? How do we leverage that to go to the state, right? And, and galvanize additional resources or through the federal government. ARPA is just one of many investments that is coming down from the federal level. Um, just, just yesterday, I actually shared with one of the chiefs here in the city administration, Department of Education just put out an RFP for, I don't even remember, a couple of million dollar RFP that has just been issued uh, for groups that are specifically looking to invest in um, mental health services for our schools, right? I'm also part of conversations uh, with community partners and the city around gun violence. We just received a grant, actually, that I, I helped to work on uh, with Chief Pryor Jones and members of the community uh, to receive just under $2 million to support gun violence. So ARPA is one pathway, but there are a multitude of pathways and we have to be strategic in thinking about how do we braid these resources that we can impact again not just the immediate urgency which there are unfortunately a couple of urgent things that are right before us um, but also think about the 5, 10, 20, 30 year uh, purview as to not just my generation not just your generation but how are we impacting the next generation. And that the whole role of just rolling all of that in, it sort of kind of answers some of the other questions. So I'm going to move to the direction, you know, council members um, as it relates to uh, how would you engage members of Cleveland City Council uh, in developing neighborhood plans and including zoning and design review challenges uh, that may come up. To the chair, members of council, I'm going to be honest, I think I have to better understand the interaction between the Planning Commission and City Council uh, to, to be able to answer that question honestly and thoughtfully. Um, as pending, pending my um, appointment to this commission, I think my first, first and foremost role is to um, spend time, of course, with the planning director, Director Wong, the chair of the planning commission, and the other members of, of that commission um, to understand how they've been functioning, how they've been operating, to understand who are the different stakeholders, including members of city council that they have interacted with, and what is the best way to go about interacting and learning from each other. Um, you know, I I think my, my roles in community have availed me the opportunity to work with council members in different capacities. Um, some are newer that I have not, like Councilman Starr, um, Councilman Harsh, uh, in previous capacities I've worked with him but not in his role as council. Um, so I think building relationships, uh, 
generally, not just because of my role on the Planning Commission, but building relationships with members of council, understanding and listening uh, to the residents and the respective wards. I think uh, while there aren't too many silver linings from the pandemic, I think making meetings accessible virtually um, has at least allowed me to attend more committee meetings, uh, just to be able to listen and to hear. I think uh, community resources like Cleveland Documenters, you know, being able to report on different meetings through different mediums, even through social media. Um, sometimes I can't be present, you know, for a particular committee meeting, um, so I'll go to the Twitter and I'll I'll check out the documenters and you know be able to get a quick snapshot, you know, in case I can't watch the video. So I think for me it's about understanding the priorities of not just one council person but council as a whole. Um, but it's also important to understand what is the common vision, right? You may represent a specific ward, you have the specific priorities of your residents as your priority, but you're you're part of a whole, right? And we think about I'm from New York, so I'm gonna use a pizza analogy because uh, you know we have the best New York pizza. Um, if we think about, you know, the pieces of, of the pie, right, or a stew or a chili, however analogy, you know, resonates with you, it's not just about one ingredient, right? Each of you are contributing to making our city a community of choice, right? And within the city, each of you have a responsibility of a specific neighborhood, um, but you're only as good as your neighbor. Um, so really it's thinking about not just the individual priorities of, of a ward, um, but also what is the common vision and what is the common goal that we're seeking for all residents of the city. Given that some areas of the city of Cleveland haven't received any development dollars in, in 20 years, what changes would you suggest to promote development in those areas? to the chair, to the members of council, thank you for the question. Um, so I think you started to go this route before just as far as what are my suggestions of different things that we should be looking at. So there are a multitude of policies I think that um, could be on the table for consideration, um, not just because other cities have done them, but just they are best practices that are, that are you know, sort of bubbling up um, in the world of development. Um, prior to, to leaving the Cleveland Neighborhood Progress, I had the opportunity to work with council members of the administration, along with my colleagues at CMP and Enterprise Community Partners um, on the tax abatement study. So unfortunately, my tenure ended. I, didn't, I was unable to see that through, um, but was very involved in, in the early part of that um, study. Um, I think one of the contributions I was able to make to that study was uh, recommending to, at the time, the members of council and administration that were part of that conversation that we needed to bring in community voice. So we had received uh, an earmark, I believe, um, City Council was able to receive an earmark to contract with an economic um, focused firm uh, that was going to be looking at really the, the numbers side of the quantitative side of what t tax abatement has been uh, and the impact it's had on the city. Um, but we needed a balanced approach. We need the quantitative as well as the qualitative. Um, and I was pretty insistent upon us making sure that we retain the services of a community-based organization that could, while the economic folks were focusing on the numbers, could also get the, the impact of, or excuse me, the insight from residents. Um, that, that process did end up going through. Neighborhood Connections was retained to serve in that capacity, and they held a number of listening sessions and conversations, which I think helped to contribute to this balanced perspective of, you know, you need the data, you need the hard numbers, but you also need to hear directly from people. So that's one example. Um, through through that research, you know, I had the opportunity to look at thousands, I think it felt like maybe not quite thousands, but many uh, different policies uh, that were deemed best practices. Um, one in particular um, stood out to me in Philadelphia called Loop, um, long-term uh, long occupancy, I'm forgetting what the last, uh, maybe properties. Um, Chris? No? I know exactly what it is, but... I see you shaking my head. <laughs> so I said, all right, finish it up. Yeah, so Loop was really interesting to me because if you're obviously familiar with like senior homestead that um, protects seniors from not um, being subjected to increases in home value and the impact on their taxes, um, Loop was very similar, but it was focused on long-term occupants. So when you have a neighborhood that has seen you know a pretty dramatic increase in home value, if you have a certain time period that you have occupied your home, 
similar to the senior homestead, you wouldn't be subjected to, you know, your taxes going up. Um, I think that's really important. I probably was even more hypersensitive when I think about my parents who, um, um, you know, are mature uh, in their age. And, you know, some of these things become more palpable for yourself, you know, when, when you look at and think about where people are in their different life stages. Um, I think part of really thinking about communities of choice is also about accountability, right? Um, you know, while I was not necessarily in the weeds in this particular perspective at CMP, um, understanding, you know, the, the outside investors that are coming in and, and snatching up our properties. Um, I live in the old Brooklyn neighborhood, of which uh, Councilman Harsh is my, my council person. Um, the former leadership of the, of the Community Development Corporation, Jeff, excuse me, um, Jeff Fresby, excuse me, goodness gracious. Um, he and I talked. Uh, he, um, he very early on, when I first moved to the neighborhood, you know, shared some of the challenges that they, as a community development corporation, were experiencing because they wanted to be able to, of course, you know, have have the properties or purchase the properties to keep them, you know, within within the neighborhood and not have the outside, um, sometimes international influence of of folks purchasing the properties. Um, but unfortunately, they were challenged, like many other community development corporations, of not having ample loan reserves to be able to purchase these homes, right? So thinking about policies, how we can work with our local banks, how we can work with our state legislators and local legislators to really think innovatively about how do we provide, in this case, the community development corporations with tools and the resources so that they can purchase more properties. We can obviously have more authenticity around who is purchasing and rehabbing those properties. Um, and then there's other, you know, I think equitable development best practices. You know, I know I'm also on the board of Midtown Cleveland um, uh, under Director Wong former leadership, along with her colleagues there at Midtown, um, they've done a number of different trainings directly with real estate investor, real estate developers in helping them understand, you know, why they need to prioritize racial equity in, in their development processes. So I think it's a both and, like there are actual tangible policies that we can adopt either at the federal, state, or local level, um, but some of it is about training and, and not not letting people to be off the hook um, and holding them accountable to the efficacy of what the standards are for our city and what we believe the residents of our city deserve. Great. I, I, I think that's an excellent answer. What uniquely qualifies you to sit on the Planning Commission and tell us why uh, we should appoint you? Through the chair to the members of council, I think first and foremost is that I have a servant heart. Um, I'm in service to the community. Um, I'm a, an avid learner, um, so I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I always say that. Um, I want to listen. I want to absorb. Um, but for those that know me, um, I'm the one that's sending like all the articles and the podcasts and have you seen this and have you seen that? Um, I just think it's important to, to consistently challenge even your own thinking. Um, so just because I had a perspective or, or saw something a certain way um, five, ten years ago doesn't mean I've maintained that. You know, I may have gained additional knowledge and information that has helped me um, increase and expand my thinking. I think secondly, the fact that I've made Cleveland my home. Um, I married in Clevelander, if that gives me any bonus points. <laughs> um, and, you know, have chosen to live in this city. You know, when I first moved here, I, I went to a suburb because I didn't know anything else, you know, like just really from a recommendation from a colleague at the time. Um, but when my husband and I uh, decided that we wanted to purchase our first home, I said to him, I want to live in the city of Cleveland, and he agreed. Um, he's a born and raised Clevelander. Um, his parents are in the Heights now, but you know he spent you know his grandparents and spent a majority of time in the city. And so that's important to us that we have made an investment in our city. I think thirdly, um, understanding the diversity of positions that I have held um, while living in the city of Cleveland. Um, I've had the great advantage of being in direct service, um, working in various social and human service organizations, but I've also had the opportunity to serve as a lobbyist and work in the policy and legislative space. Um, in the last couple of years, I've also stepped into a role around funding and fund development. Um, so my last full-time position was serving as uh, the executive director of a statewide funding collaborative 
where I worked with local philanthropy to raise money and uh, bring those monies directly to individuals working to advance and advocate for more fair and equitable um, criminal legal system policies. Um, we Cleveland Votes, which is my full-time job now, we're also a funder. So in addition to uh, the practitioner role, we also provide grants to nonprofits in the region to support their civic and voter engagement work as well. And this is where you're a lobbyist at, at this uh, organization? Um, I served as a lobbyist when I was at Cleveland Neighborhood Progress. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I think just, again, the diversity of the roles that I've held. Um, I've also always had many community commitments, maybe too many. Um, so in addition uh, to my full-time work, I currently serve on NOACA's Community Advisory Council. Um, I've been on that council for probably about four or five years. I currently serve as a chair of that particular council. Um, I'm currently on Midtown Cleveland's board. Um, I also serve on the county's Public Defender Commission, um, have been on that board for a number of years. Um, and before you ask me the question about Friday mornings, uh, currently Cleveland Votes is hybrid. So we are in the office Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, and we're remote Mondays and Fridays so that we can make sure we have space in our schedule um, to do work because you know how it is. You're in meetings all day, um, and you have to actually have to get to the work. So um, when I first had the conversation with Director Wong, I made sure that I was proactive in blocking out my calendar on Fridays um, so that my, my fellow teammates uh, knew not to schedule anything at that time. I told them I don't know the time frame, but let's just keep this blocked um, in the event that I am fortunate enough to be appointed to this commission. Um, so I think, yeah, I think I will stop there as far as the qualifications. Uh, the, the chair rests and uh, opens it up to the the table to the committee. Chris Harsh. Well, thank you, Chairman. Uh, you did preempt my question. Um, <laughs> but I'll just go ahead and say that uh, I'm very excited to see your name come across uh, as an applicant for this. I have had the pleasure of working with, with Ms. Anthony in the past, and I cannot think of a higher caliber person to fill the needs of the Planning Commission. Um, absolute uh, 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 powerhouse and, and compassion, breadth of understanding, knowledge. You know this city very, very well. I, um, and I think, again, it's also very good for our city to have people from outside of our city who embrace it, who come here, who adopt Cleveland, who see it with fresh eyes. Because I think sometimes we, people, I'm not from Cleveland either, right? So I think people that are from here sometimes have these, these strange uh, uh, cemented thoughts about our city that aren't necessarily uh, true or, or real. And it's, it's a breath of fresh air to have people um, moving to the city and contributing as much as Ms. Anthony is. So your board is okay with you taking Friday mornings to dedicate to this work? Yes. Okay. To the chair through the councilman Harsh, yes, thank you. Uh, and you're also reminding me of the trip we did uh, to DC. Um, I actually organized a trip uh, with uh, some of the community development corporation staff members. Uh, I'm not sure right now what, what particular thing was at risk <laughs> uh, before our members of Congress, um, but we had about 20, 20 some odd community development, both directors and staff members, um, and it was a great trip. We did get snowed in, but aside from mm -hmm. that, um, it was a great opportunity for me to, to bring leaders from our community and, and have them advocate directly directly to members of Congress about what's most pressing around community and economic development in our region. Well, you'll be a great addition to the board, and you further my secret agenda of getting Ward 13 member uh, residents into every single commission committee and, and, and <laughs> board we have in this city. So, welcome to the to chair, board. to the councilman. Thank you. Uh, finding there no other questions, um, our uh, committee is so satisfied that we only had one question for you. Uh, and we appreciate you taking the time and spending your time to to serve on the Planning Commission. And uh, we're quite, I know I'm quite impressed with your background. Uh, and I, I just want to say thank you for not only in the role of uh, being employed at some of these locations, but at the same time, it is an act of service in serving our community. So we appreciate the work that you've done in our community. Uh, we look forward to you being uh, on, being seated here officially, uh, and we look forward to working with you and improving our communities so that all of Cleveland have um, uh, great neighborhoods and communities in which to live in. So if there's no unreadiness, we approve your appointment to the Planning Commission. Through the chair to the members of council, thank you very much. And the chair calls this uh, committee to end unless there's any discussions. Seeing none.